coming up on Texas Parks and Wildlife. The idea of this predator deterrent fence is to deflect predators away from the nest area so that hopefully they won't find the nest and destroy it. If there is a big event, you need to have the data there beforehand so you can look at it before and after. In this day and age, children need to get outside more. Family camping is probably one of the greatest ways to bring your family together. Texas Parks and Wildlife, a television series for all outdoors. This is the Atwater Prairie Chicken National Wildlife Refuge. And folks have shown up at the annual Atwater's Prairie Chicken Festival for a rare glimpse at one of the most endangered birds in North America. And I got him in the scope now. Oh, he's got his, his tufts erect. He's, he's going into his dance. Oh, fantastic. Over a century ago, the coastal prairies of Texas and Louisiana were home to almost a million Atwater's prairie chickens. But as habitat turned to farmland and Houston and other cities grew, the coastal prairie shrank. Now less than 1% of pristine coastal prairie is left, and this refuge is one of the Atwater's last strongholds. It's been teetering right on the, the brink of extinction. Over the last uh, 15, 20 years, there have been fewer than, than 100 individuals in wild, wild populations. And for a species that only lives on average of two years, that's a very bad place to be. You know, there are endangered species all over the rest of the country and the world, but this one here lives only in Texas, and it's part of the natural heritage of, of Texans. We just found a nest. It's the fourth uh, nest that we found this season. She's extremely well hidden. She's in very, uh, very dense cover, and uh, that, that's a good thing. That means uh, hopefully predators won't see her either. With some rebar and some metal fencing, the team is here to set up what they call a predator deterrent fence to protect that nesting female. The predators are, are moving through the grassland. The idea of this predator deterrent fence is to deflect predators away from the nest area so that hopefully they won't find the nest and destroy it. Got it. The fence doubles the chances of survival for the mother and her brood of chicks. You do kind of keep in mind that, you know, the whole time you're working, there's a bird in there that's, you know, struggling for survival, basically. So you want to build a fence that's going to hopefully work and give them a little bit better chance at surviving. There's word that one of the female's nests... So where was that exactly? ...has been destroyed. Oh, okay. Oh, man, we got... We got eggshells and the nest bowl's been disturbed, so it's been predated. Oh yeah, the yeah. eggshells everywhere. Yeah, something's really, really dug it up. Uh, she put up a good fight yeah, though. Yeah, she's little feathers everywhere. Poor thing. To help the moms and these newly hatched chicks that are just two weeks old. Go ahead and clean the pans. The hen and chicks stay in a protective brood box, an enclosed refuge with an all-you-can-eat buffet of veggies and bugs. And there are grasshoppers, katydids, beetles, but mainly grasshoppers. Um, those make really good chick food. Once the chicks have, have hatched, uh, conditions have been so dry that uh, the young chicks are having difficulty finding uh, insects to eat. Just call out the numbers so we make sure we get all 14. This breeding season so far, we're starting to notice that it seems to be getting a little bit drier. It's been very windy this spring. So we're a little bit concerned about how the chicks are going to fare. It should be all of them. 
The young chicks get a final weigh-in, as their release into the wild is now just days away. 26.9. We like to weigh them just to make sure that they are indeed getting enough food and metabolizing it correctly and Last putting one. on weight. One more. Okay, it's time for them to, to take off on their own now. They've had their two weeks of head starting and they're looking pretty good. Yep. It's fun to see every couple days they change and they get noticeably bigger, their feathers get more um, obvious and colorful, they've gained weight, they're looking healthy, hopefully they'll have what it takes to survive. We feel good. We got them here to, to this this point, um, but at the same time, we're a, we're a little anxious as well. I hope they can do it. They're really going to have to be on their uh, best of their game if they're going to make it to the point where they'll have a chance to reproduce as well. While these birds are struggling in the wild, the team has an ace up their sleeve. Head looks good, mouth looks good, so she's good to go. Several facilities raise endangered Atwater's prairie chickens as part of a captive breeding program. She looks in good shape, feather condition is good adding birds from the captive breeding program has allowed us to keep birds in the wild through the last uh, 10, 15 years. Okay, she's ready to go. Without the captive breeding program, uh, this species undoubtedly would have been extinct by now. These juvenile prairie chickens are color banded, radio collared, pretty bird, and ready for the refuge. It's a long journey to their new home, as these captive birds are for now the lifeblood for this entire species. Okay, okay. She's in good shape. Ready to roll, aren't you? Working with an endangered species, it, especially the arguably the most endangered bird in North America, you know, it has its ups and downs. I mean, sometimes it's, you know, a little bit disappointing. Things don't go quite as well as you want, but it's also rewarding when things do. So I think everyone would agree it's worth it. Doesn't she look good? Mm-hmm. She does. How many other species can we watch go extinct before it starts making a, a difference in, in the ability of the world to support us as a human species? And, and we don't know that answer. After two weeks of acclimating to their new habitat, it's time for these young birds to venture out. All right, little birds, go be wild. All this work, the struggles throughout the breeding season, it's up to these young atwaters to help save the species. Oh, yeah, see, freedom. While not all of the birds that we release are gonna survive, we know that, but those that do survive uh, represent the future. Their offspring hopefully will be better able to survive and reproduce in the wild on their own. You know, we will continue to build the population with those wild individuals and, and that's where we place the hope for the recovery of, of, of the species. My name's Rebecca Hensley. I work with Coastal Fisheries Division. Hey Jackie, this is Rebecca. I'm the Regional Director of Ecosystem Resources Program. We work with fisheries and their associated habitat. Rebecca is the best supervisor I've ever had. She helps us uh, with our professional development. She helps us with um, understanding our policies. And we should probably see if we can get some better science on that. She always puts a lot of time and effort to make sure that we have the tools that we need 
and the guidance in order for us to respond when we're out in the field. Setting out the side scan sonar equipment. I value the people I work with and I know that they have a lot to give. Hey Sandy, this is Rebecca and Dickinson. We're going to chat with you a little bit about After Hurricane Ike, when we lost over 50% of the oyster reefs in Galveston Bay, the disaster money was utilized to come back in and try to restore some of those. And so we were able to add staff to a team, and it was specifically to build a habitat assessment team. So right now, we're outside of Redfish Bay State Scientific Area, which is part of the Coastal Preserve System. It has a lot of really unique, beautiful habitat, and we're collecting side scan sonar data. Side scan sonar is pictures made with sound, so basically it pings out sound into the water and it listens for the energy of that sound that comes back, and from that it makes a picture. So we're just basically trying to create maps of different habitat types that we see out here. If there is a big event, you need to have the data there beforehand so you can look at it before and after. Well, the ultimate goal would be to have at least a current baseline of what the habitats are from Sabine all the way down to the lower Laguna Madre. Started off as a Hurricane Ike disaster recovery aspect, and we just built onto that. We've got a couple extra boats, some more team members to assist in, in some of that mapping of the bay bottom. It's just the beginning. As on most weekends, Ryan Spencer is packing for a trip. We do about 36 weekends a year. You could call it a mission trip. I work out of a trailer and we go all over the state. It's a unique office, but I really love it. Ryan travels to win converts, but his mission is not a religious one. You might say he's an outdoor evangelist. I go from park to park and show people how to go camping for the first time. I'm an outdoor education specialist at Texas Parks and Wildlife, and uh, I specialize in getting people outside and uh, connecting them with nature. Today, Ryan is at Blanco State Park. Thank you all for coming out. Introducing some families to camping on behalf of the Texas Outdoor Family Program. Studies have shown that children who spend time outside are healthier, happier, and stronger, that they do better in school, and they have better family cohesion. So that means that children who spend more time with their parents outside become nicer teenagers when they grow up. So they're all good reasons, but we're gonna try to make it easy for you. We're gonna go through each item. We teach about leave no trace and how to protect the environment when you're out there enjoying it. We wanna give them some skills that they can repeat on their own when they come back to the state park. So things like cooking on a camp stove, setting up a tent. We'll just unfold this thing like so. We've got a series of aluminum poles. And we'll just lay it through there. Watching carefully are Karenia Holloway, her mother Karen, and friend Isaiah. The Holloways have only camped once before. The first camping trip I did was back in December, and that was all new for me. And, and we had a blast, and I really enjoyed it. My daughter's kind of a natural at it. She just likes, you know, being outdoors, which draws me in. And we're enjoying today. I was talking to Karenia, and she asked me if I wanted to go. And, you know, my initial reaction was no. He didn't want to go camping. If something crawled on him, he was out. I, I like being inside with the AC. But, you know, getting out here now, it, it, it just it feels good. We need one more. Young neighbor Calvin has also been invited along. And he's pretty excited to spend his first night in the outdoors. Go, 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 go. He's been very excited today. It's just really hard to keep him still. Setting up the tent, I mean, he's just jumped right in there. You need help? When he first pulled out all the stuff, it was a little intimidating. Oh, it's there. It wasn't that difficult. Perfect. Yep. You're not alone. You know, you can do this. And if you need help, ask for help. There you go. You got the strongest man on the job, though. <laughs> <laughs> this actually gives you a time to come together and just talk to one another and just experience life together. And so that's something that we don't always get the opportunity to do. Other campers are here for similar reasons. 
We thought this would be a great way to kind of get the kids outside of the house, uh, away from the technology, the iPads, uh, television. And realizing being outdoors, having some fun outside can be a great way to spend the weekend. Kind of like a trade. A little technology can help the transition. Do you know what GPS stands for? Does anybody know? There's two spheres of thought. The one is that we pluck kids away from technology completely. And the other is that we kind of ease them into it. Fun day today. I'm kind of a fan of the latter. What we do is what we call a modern day treasure hunt. Geocaching, for example. There's a bunch of satellites up in the sky to actually relay your exact location and coordinates onto this thing. This one goes north. Technology may tend to keep us indoors, but geocaching combines gadgets with outdoor exploration. So you're close. It says what? Four feet. Ah, oh, they already found it. <laughs> I don't know where it is. I like going around and finding stuff with the GPS. It's right in this area. Kevin really enjoyed the geocaching and just even seeing what's out here was really nice. He was on the hunt for something. <laughs> it has to be one of these plants. Oh! You found it! Everyone loves a treasure hunt. Where'd it go? Regardless of the treasure itself. Where is it? I don't know, it's a piece of paper. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. We spent a nice chunk of time locating a couple of things and the kids enjoyed finding a little treasure. By afternoon, the cool Blanco River is calling. Yippee do, sir. And there's another way to enjoy the water. Kayak. Paddling a kayak is a new experience for Calvin. Yes, sir. Can I get a high five? <laughs> That's what's up. Right. At first, he didn't want to do it, but after we got in the boat, smooth sailing, you know, he was all for it. Yeah, Calvin, that's good. Going up the river, <laughs> down the river, yeah, pretty cool. Uh-oh. We were out one direction, then we were out another direction, and finally my daughter said, Mom, just put your paddle down, just sit and relax. I really like being in the water because it's really serene, it's kind of peaceful, but it's hard to kind of steer. I tried. <laughs> they ran into us. Well, I don't know if you saw that collision. <laughs> but after that, it was pretty good. It was just something I had never done before, so maybe if I do it a few more times, maybe it will finally get through to my brain what to do exactly. <laughs> but I had fun. Never done kayaking before, this was the first time uh, so it's a little bit hesitant. I don't know if he was going to like it or not, and uh, he enjoyed it. And there are more firsts for the Folgar family, who hail from a place where camping doesn't come naturally. From New York City. Closest I've been to camping was uh, in 2004. We had a blackout. <laughs> but the lack of experience doesn't keep Aiden from catching his first fish. First one ever. It's a pretty cool fish, Aiden. Yeah. Pretty awesome. Of course, a fish is not guaranteed for every family. What am I doing wrong? But some guidance is always available. <laughs> We're going to go one direction. That was something completely like new for me, you know? going out there and really trying to work at it casting it. You make it look really easy. You have to really just get it right there when you're you clicking the button, but that was fun. And so I would do that again. I would. I didn't reel in the gator, but, you know, maybe next time. When I was a kid, I grew up in the concrete jungle known as Dallas, Fort Worth. Spent most of my life there, and we spent a lot of time just in the city. And my dad uh, sat us down and said, well, you guys are gonna get outside. So he decided right then and there that he was going to make a commitment to me and my brother to go camping all the time. We went camping every single month for seven years as a family. And so I developed this real love for getting outside, and we're still very, very close, and I think it has a lot to do with the fact that we went camping so much. What time is it? A weekend is over quickly. Oh, darn. So one outing may not make lifelong campers. You want to leave the poles where they are. You make it easy for folks uh, to come out and try it for the first time. You want time. to make sure that you let it dry out. We try to take the scariness away from camping. And we're just going to drop it in. Thank you very much. I'm going to try one weekend can the introduce the simple of the joys of getting outdoors together. They show you how to camp. We're highly satisfied with what Texas Outdoor Families did for our family. 
We just try to make sure that the experiences that they have with us, uh, they have the confidence to go out and do on their own again. Uh, the next time I do this, because you know, there will be a next time I enjoyed it that much, I'm going to bring some insect repellent. Yeah. <laughs> Other than that, yeah, definitely we'll try it again. Definitely. My wife, she's eager to, to be a part of this as well. All right, we got everybody. One, you look at me? two, three. Outdoor family. Woo, that looks good. I hope to bring like more people the next time that haven't done it just so they can experience it. It's nice to do something different and, uh, and have some nice time out with the family and friends. I'm the one who has to put everything away. Everything had a place, and now it's basically just like... We'll probably try it again sometime uh, throughout the summer. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, I think he'll always have this memory. He's had a great outing. I've been so blessed to get to help connect kids with nature and with their families. That's what it's all about for me. Family's had a blast. All the stuff's back in the trailer. It's a good day. So with the last family packed up, Ryan's tent revival heads to its next state park. It, it revitalizes you to get to see all of these families come together in our state parks because that's what these parks are here for. To see a calendar of upcoming workshops near you, visit our website and join the Texas Outdoor Family Congregation. Welcome to the Big Bend. When people first come out here, they look at the harshness of the desert and think, how could anybody survive out here? But if you look closer at the plants and the diversity out here, you'd realize that everything we need is right here all around us. So let's go take a look at what we have out here and how we could survive off the land. This is creosote. This is probably one of the most common shrubs in the Chihuahuan Desert. It smells like the wood preservative you put on railroad ties and on uh, telephone poles. It's also excellent for your stomach and all your internal organs as long as you don't do too much of it. One of our rangers, whenever he had a stomach ache, his mother would feed him creosote tea. He'd rather go to school with a stomach ache than have to stay at home and drink his mother's creosote tea all day long. Here's one of my favorite cactus. This is the strawberry pitaya. Every spring, it's covered with purple magenta blooms. Then right after that, it starts putting on fruit. When the fruit is ripe, it's a race between javelinas and humans to see who's going to collect the most of it. This is the okatea. It's probably uh, known as one of the icons of the Chihuahuan Desert. The okatea will bloom in the springtime, and you can take those flowers and make a tea out of it. it tastes a lot like hibiscus flower tea. A lot of the crowds out here are made out of okatea stalks. Don't even have to use your uh, bob wire. It carries its own barbs on it. Sotol is probably one of the most versatile plants in all the Chihuahuan Desert. Just about everything on this plant can be used. You can have these wonderful green straps. You can weave them together for floor mats or bedding mats as cordage for anything you might need to tie together. Uh, these will work. Then what you're left with is the heart of the solto. It's the heart of the solto we can eat. You dig a pit, line the pit with rock, build a fire inside the pit, let it burn down the coals. Throw the solto heart on top of these coals. The next morning, you take your machete and you split it open in the middle. And then you take the tender leaves that are on the inside and you scrape the meat off between your teeth like you would be eating an artichoke. And be surprised how sweet it is. It tastes a lot like a cabbage that's been cooked in brown sugar. The desert seems to be a harsh environment, but as you can tell, the desert is full of life. So come visit us here at Big Bend Ranch State Park. Yeehaw!